Hey guys, uh, welcome to my talk today. So yeah, we're going to be going over um, potty pots today. Um, just give you a brief intro on who I am. I am a uh, security analyst for uh, NCC, previously Quorum Cyber. I have um, interest in forensics and TI. I like, I like music, so we'll have to go into gigs frequently. Um, recently participated in the uh, CTF called Trace Labs, which was quite a nice little um, uh, search party for looking at for real mi- missing people. Um, I'm a general geek and movie buff. I like them. Um, just a general uh, brief overview of what we're going into today. So we're going to be going into what honeypots are, for those that may be familiar with them or not, and just a general history of them, because that's kind of where a bit of the importance of how their development came about, and the various types that you may have of them, and defending against attackers, so how we actually use them as a detection and defense mechanism, um, and just showing a demo in action and summarizing it off. So, for those who... Oh, that was a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> Please stop. Right, okay. So, who knows what a honey pot is, right? Well, <laughs> it's not an actual honey in a pot. <laughs> it's like my friend for that one. It's not the type of honey pot that Winnie the Pooh likes. Um, honey pot is simply a bit of software like that. It's used as a bait or lure to lure attackers in. Um, it's like a use for dete- deception through detection ta- type tactics. So the idea is you deceive an attacker, but you're also able to, be, to attack them at the same time. Um, as this little diagram shows here, that you're able to not only place it inside your own um, internal network, but you're able to place it externally as well, which we'll go into a bit later, what the purpose of those are. Um, it's designed to be attacked, prodded, and compromised on purpose. So like there aren't, um, ger- honeypots are generally dormant machines, so anything that's meant to interact with them, isn't, it shouldn't be interacting with them, but I'll go into a bit more detail about that later as well. So they're separated, separated into three primary types. So you have your honey token, your honey service, and your honey system. So your honey token is mimicking legitimate data. So like you have uh, spreadsheets, uh, SQL databases, and um, things I could probably store passwords on. Anything that an attacker may think this is legitimate data. Um, your honey service is just anything mimicking to like SSH server, FTP, HTTP, and name it. It's just meant to show that the service is interactive to a point. And then finally, Honey System is mimicking the actual operating system. So anything from Windows 10 trying to communicate the behavior of a Red Hat Linux server. Um, but it's not meant to really serve much of a business purpose, so usually attackers kind of avoid that. Um, there's different levels of interactivity. So... Um, they're separated from low to high. So low is typically your decoy, so I said detection mechanism. So they're generally used for more like the diagram shows. You place it internally to in order to pick up uh, intrusions in your networks like an IDS. Um, there's high um, behavior though, which is, or high interactivity, which is more like there's going to be a lot more um, activity with the attacker. So you're going to see a lot more um, things trying to be compromised in it. Um, and generally it's, if people kind of shy away from more of the higher interactive stuff because they could be, they are, they do pose a kind of a bit of a danger um, at times. And um, for those that may be a Dota 2 player, the probably the worst thing recently, um, if you're uh, for a honeypot, you recently, Valve recently banned about 40,000 players just because of a honeypot they deployed when they're updating their software. So they allowed for um, anything that matched some of the software, like uh, in terms of cheats, uh, they Valve automatically ban them based on that signature. So, oh, oh, animation. So, now that we've kind of discussed what a honeypot is, we're going to go, go way back to its history. So, um, honeypots started all the way back in the 1980s. Um, and Cliff, like a man called Cliff Stoll, who to this day has been classed as an early pioneer um, of learning what uh, honeypots are and using it as an intrusion. So, this is from a book uh, known by, uh, called by the Cookies Egg, if anyone's interested. And the general story was that Cliff was a, an astronomer at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. He generally was helping maintain the computer systems of that school. So one night, Cliff noticed that 75 cents of the computer's time was being used up with uh, upon reviewing the accounting firm. So generally, this is the time when uh, dial-up internet was a bit of a thing, uh, for those that had to experience it. Uh, I know I did growing up. Uh, that was a lot of money. <laughs> Um, so, Cliff noticed that he couldn't specific, uh, specify to one singular user. 
Um, and further investigation led to the laboratory was under attack. So Cliff designed, uh, Cliff was able to use security monitoring tools and with the help of other tactics to set up alerts when the attacker connected to the network. Um, upon that uh, point, uh, uh, Cliff was able to help with the help of um, phone companies at the time, uh, communicate exactly where the attacker was coming from, trace the call back to Germany. Uh, but the problem was though that they weren't able to exactly pinpoint the same location that the cliff needed to, so that would require on-site maintenance from one of their engineers. And typically this would take hours and hours, longer than the normal attacker session would go about. So Cliff kind of got frustrated, but he decided to dive deeper into what uh, trying to pick up the attacker. So he developed, developed the idea of well, he the very first honeypot from the help of his partner um, called the SDNI project. So that was a fake, uh, fake missile defense system um, that he devised based on the research of what the attacker was trying to look for because they were exploiting vulnerabilities and using the laboratory as a pivot point to target US governments and military targets. So Cliff was able to put legit like, fake files on it and um, uh, fake files on it and be able to lure the attacker in, keep them there long enough so that um, they were able to keep uh, track of it. So not only are there, um, Cliff was able to find the uh, help of law enforcement and the attacker. So Moving on from out there, we're going into the late 90s, or sorry, early 90s, sorry. Um, Bill Cheswick created a series of custom built uh, fake honeypot service, services that carried a array of services like <coughs> STP, uh, HTTP, SSH, you name it. Um, he was able to mimic like certain notable uh, deep, uh, debug or bugs within um, STP, SMTP, and allowed for um, being able to lure the attacker in based on what their behavior was into a prison cell type environment. And from there, Bill was able to learn exactly what the attacker was doing vulnerability wise. So throwing, he was able to like see that he was targeting certain vulnerabilities and with the help of there, essentially this is the aspect where not only did the honeypot carry on from an IDS point of view, but for more research, which we'll go into a bit more later. And this kind of this behavior kind of came apart more with the um, uh, Honeynip uh, project, which is like carried out by a group of re uh, researchers. To so this day, it's still um, an ongoing thing, and they allowed for um, uh, devising honeypots into two different sections or categories. So you have your production, which is generally your decoy uh, IDS, and research, which is just learning about what the attackers do and their general tactics. But the thing they noticed though was that because this was the journey of the age of the worm and the rise of other malware that came apart, the shift from uh, general detection for honeypots moved away and research became the focal point. So they were able to learn a lot more about exactly what kind of um, attack traffic the attackers were pretty much carrying. And carrying on really, the present day, there is a lot more um, by organizations. But back in the day, um, during Cliff's time, they weren't really exactly the most ideal thing to be uh, used on. Uh, people were scared of like how what way it would house data, or would it be able to like you know let the attacker be able to compromise it or use it against us? All those questions came apparent, um, but it's a bit more um, accepted. So honeypots can fit into two following ca categories, like I mentioned. So first, you have your research, which is gathering insight into attackers' tools, tactics, and procedures. Um, useful for when you need like to kind of gather an IOC feed. I've had that personally as a working in, in a SOC that I've seen a customer use a honeypot for such a purpose, and you just usually see a ton of alerts just hitting that one box. And then, secondly, you have production, which is usually a decoy system. So learning what exactly the when the attacker is about to connect, be able to like get alarms sent to you notifications wise. Um, this normally does this um Concern, concern yourself for not only external threats, but also insider threats. So, learn exactly uh, you may have in, insiders uh, within your organization that may be disgruntled employees um, for various different reasons. 
So you may need to, may need to like deploy honeypots in the certain bits of your network so that way um, you're able to pick, pick up behavior. But the problem is though is that you may need to keep that um, more of a hush hush um, ordeal so that um, not only a certain number of teams may know about his awareness because otherwise if you let um, people know about where the honeypots are, it defeats the purpose of, the, of exactly why I was deployed in the first place. And just like a little Blade Runner thing, it's the idea was that uh, you were able to deceive exactly, well, they believed one thing, but it was the other. So much like uh, Blade Runner, you could be able to deceive that like people thought they were human, but it turns out they were androids. And these are just a few examples of honeypots. So Calry is the one we're going to go into a bit later with the honeypot that I, I set up for a demo. And you've got Thingus Canary, which is a service that I've, I've um, used at a SOC. It's a really, really cool service. Um, they help deploy like different like your canary tokens about your uh, way. Um, and this is this is just not sales pitch by the way. I just I do find them quite interesting. <laughs> um, they they're like able to log not only exactly when there might be unauthorized logins or um, attempts into different sections of where you might place your tokens. It's a good way of actually seeing exactly what kind of activity is going on in your network. And then here's just a few open source honeypots that I got from a GitHub, which I've linked to you later on. So, like, you know, you got EWPOT, which is like your free web application uh, honeypot, um, Post USB for um, malware, um, honeypot camera, name it. There's like so much more that you can like kind of mess around with. It's just very much open source. Um, and moving on from out there, we'll learn about defending against threats. So, how does an organization benefit from it? Well, we learned that it's helping. It's helpful for early detections, such as like you know, acting as a tripwire, and be able to allow a faster response time. So typically, from my own experience, a canary, like like the thickest canaries, they do trigger quite fast, and they do alert like you know your scene tool or um, other forms of um, integration you may have. They're quite fl uh, flexible for that. There, the resource light. They don't require, require a lot of maintenance, which is quite handy when you may have to serve like a business need or purpose. Uh, helpful for login as well, because exactly, you know, they could be using credentials. So what kind of passwords are they using? Like, is, does it look like it's a corporate um, username or um, passwords? Like, kind of match up exactly if there's, like, you know, maintenance or someone's trying to, like, do things. And it has lost full false positive rate. And the reason I put the asterisk there is that um, vulnerability scanners are known to trigger these off. So typically, when you do deploy honeypots, it's best to kind of get your sensors, such as I am, um, Defender of Identities um, scanner to uh, get whitelisted or uh, any known vulnerable scanners you carry out. So that way it avoids just triggering them because they do fire off when they're like getting tripped up. And that helps when, uh, like I mentioned, uh, honeypots are dormant machines so they don't get uh, poked on unless they are um, interacted with on purpose. So when they do alert, you have to pretty much react immediately. Like that is like their nature. And moving on from that, we get to the threat actor's nightmare. So there's a number of things that kind of can make a, an, act, an act, threat actor say bad. So honeypots create frustration. Um, they may be trying to set themselves a goal, and particularly with time as well, because time is a necessity from when they're trying to move about and quickly achieve a goal. So when not only are they dealt with a honeypot that may use up the resources, it creates a lot of frustration, it may, it may end up leaving, or they may keep trying to trying to do it. So like um, Bill did, you'd be able to create a uh, a prison-like environment um, which couldn't be compromised or um, inf um, inf uh, infect other bits of the system. So that allows for um, you just mess around with the attacker and just generally annoying them until they go away. Uh, deceiving them. So the art of perception is a profound thing with honeypots. You need to make sure like exactly how you're trying to deceive them. <clears throat> so it could be anything from how you place the honeypot, exactly what it's trying to do, and what it, it's and what your goal is trying to see when it alerts. So yeah, that's just generally a good thing for um, reducing twelve time as well. So your your attacker could already be in at this point. It could be hopping from one bit to the other, um, and the honeypot could be placed in such a way that, well, like, if you have a number of honeypots in your network, um, the honeypot could pick up on it and allow for um, not only you to spot the attacker in their tracks, but it could also cut down when, whether, whether they're right at the start or they're right in the middle, 
you'd be able to just catch them there and just isolate or lock down whatever they were coming from. And then um, that goes with um, attackers can know when they're in a honeypot. But by the point that you're able to see them there, it's too late. So they could already know, oh, this is a honeypot, but we, we've already spotted you, so you're able to just cut it out straight away. And moving on from there, I'm going to show you a honeypot in action. So um, the honeypot we're going over today is calorie. So this is designed to mimic the interactivity of SSH and Telnet. Um, it's a medium to high interaction type uh, honeypot. So used to like log brute force attempts and shell commands, the adversary could be doing. In medium interaction mode, in the interaction Unix environment, um, in Python, and in, in high interaction, it functions as an SSH and Telnet proxy. And it can also be used to help analyze malware when traffic like that there could be sent. Right, uh, for this demo, I did keep it basic, but um, you are able to do a lot more of it, which I will go into a bit on. Let's see if this works. I've got to back up, so it'll be all good. All right. It's not down. Where are you? I hope this doesn't break. <sighs> what happened? Oh, wait, never mind. I opened the wrong one. <laughs> this was just a test one. There uh, was. <clears throat> there we go. There we go. Okay, uh, so I was just testing it earlier just to make sure. Yeah, so at this point, we've already uh, set up the. So at this point, we've already set up the honeypot, and this should be able to help the. So this here will help you initiate the virtual environment. So uh, during the setup, I created a second user called Kari. This uh, helps with all the uh, backend stuff when you're to set up the honeypot. And at the point when that once it's set up, that uh, this will help initiate the virtual environment for the honeypot so the right it runs in the background. And this helps kickstart it as well. So that way I don't have to worry about going into the user. Um, and here we have our log source. So this is where we'll be able to get all the logs for when any uh, activity carries out. So if anything like, you know, suspicious ha happens wise, this is where you'll be able to find it in this folder. So if I attempted to say, log in to the machine, but failed, um, but failed, and we check our logs, We'd be able to see be able to see not only um make this bigger. Not only be able to see out there, but we'll be able to see like um the password attempt that the uh, attacker tried to carry out. So this is the honeypot here and the Kali would be the attacker. 
um, coming in. So this would log not only the password, but the, the user as well, the IP it came from, and the timestamp the activity took place. So in terms of like if you were monitoring the SOC, these uh, bits of information are important when you're trying to carry uh, communicate with a customer. So any little bit of information helps when you're trying to say like, oh, there looks like this suspicious activity. You might want to look at it immediately and kick the person out. Um, and again, you know, for further failed attempts before the connection gets lost. So, what if the attacker was successful in logging in? Come on. Please don't fight me. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many troubleshooting issues with this thing, um, honestly. Uh, oh, that's, that's funny. Uh, so fight me. Should um, work, right? Um, Okay, well, a good thing I've recorded this. <laughs> so, uh, I had so many troubleshooting error errors with this um, hotbot, like, over the week. Um, so, right, like I've explained, um, this is a demo I just recorded just as a backup, thankfully. Um, so, as I just went over, um, initiating the virtual environment, kickstarting the honeypot, and this is your log source here. So, should we. Uh, full thing in. So. It doesn't seem to. Doesn't seem to like it when I've. What's that guy? So, like I said, like this is like the attack error, and this is what the um, like it looked like. If I was trying to like log in as an unauthorized user. Um, Current kind of number of like uh, attempts. Um, you can do a lot more with them. Calorie, so you can create like a, make a full on file system with the the uh, pickle um, file system. And that allows for like, you know, to make the, what would look to be like, you know, SSH like server more interactive. So that way the attacker doesn't immediately know, oh, this is a honeypot. Uh, not only can you do that there, but you can also um, store like fake pit fat passwords as well. So if they're trying to like exfiltrate it or might under means like use it to carry other things, you will see all that activity as well. All right. So when the attacker would be successfully logging into the Thing. Be able to see not only is that the server of this, but that's what that's the honeypot. Uh, this is the shell commands that the attack will carry out. So, again, it's just a basic thing to just show you the, the concept of it. So, say if the uh, attacker was trying to uh, create new files or maybe run scripts and uh, download most of things, not only would you be able to see them doing this, but it gives you a general sense of give you a general sense exactly of what the attacker is trying to achieve. So like uh, the history shows us, the a lot of the um, early adopters of using honeypots, they use this to learn exactly what the attacker is trying to achieve. So again, this is just an example showing you this is all logging in here in the same like, IP time stop that way. And not only out there, it helps you kind of discover exactly what's their motives and what they're trying to like, you know, achieve. And this, this, this helps go a long way um, when not only is Honeypots as a deception tool, but detecting it, but as a, um, when either it's you know, in the middle or at the beginning, for example. So that's generally the idea of it. And just a kind of a, just an overall summary, you learn what the Honeypots are and what the onboard history of them is, how you can use like many different Honeypots to your own advantage. And the importance of having um, other forms of detection. So, you know, honeypots aren't like the, uh, like the silver bullet you need. You need other things on top of that. But having an extra layer of detection and protection helps a long way for your own business or like, you know, managed service provider. Um, and also, finally, the ability to gather intelligence on the adversary. So 
with a little um, request for David. <laughs> this is just a little um, work, work of art. The, um, <laughs> I thought I put in for him. <laughs> and um, yeah, just shout out to Dave McKenzie for helping me with some pointers um, on this year, especially uh, Chris Sanders as well for his intrigue in the Texas Honey Book. I helped a big time with history because I was trying to pinpoint exactly what um, it all started, and that book has just been a massive help. Um, a list of honey pots as well that I mentioned as well, that's, they're all um, on there. The most majority of them are open source, as far as I'm aware, and um, just like the Calvary as well. And finally, a shout out to Anna and Elmo for helping me with practice talks. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Any questions? Any other questions? Just... Oh. What's the most interesting thing you've ever done in your development? Interesting thing I find? <laughs> um, yeah, like, I mean, like I said, calorie was like um, coinciding with other forms of detection to pick up uh, malware traffic. So I was like, ah, uh, that was a bit of an interesting one to actually see. And not only is it like a nice little um, configurable honeypot, but you could do so much with it to actually make it look so real. So, like, that goes back to, like, the different types of interaction and, and generally how you deceive the attacker. So, your goal is to make sure the attacker doesn't know it's a honeypot yet until when, whether it's too late or too soon. I mean, you want them to trigger it so that way you're able to point, pinpoint exactly where, the, where they are and maybe what they're doing. Um, with Calvary, actually, you can actually create a prison environment and actually just trap them there and just spin up in an in instance each time, just like infuriating them to the point where they just want to leave. So that's, that's, that's a good, good way of um, wasting resources on our end, but it doesn't really affect you that much. And generally, because this is like a low, medium to like um, high interaction, depending on what way I deploy this, of course, I mean, it won't really do much damage. I mean, depend, of course, like you don't want high interaction honeypots with your network because otherwise if it's compromised, it could be used as a um, form of uh, attacking. Anyone else? Yeah? Have you ever um, seen like, uh, in like real time someone access my honeypot? Like, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> it was. Funny a, you see that. Yeah, well, I see it in real time, but yeah, I know it's. Um, we we got the alert like we got like, one time I was like when I was working um, like currently actually in my socket well um, someone was uh, performing like, you know a lot of logins on it you can still see it actually carry it out as well depending on why it logs because you can get honeypots in real time but like you know like some canary tokens they do they'll trigger a number of alerts for the same thing and then it'll kind of update it almost but you'll see like a whole list of like passwords and stuff and it turns out it was just you know. Someone from the IT team was just carrying up maintenance. So, but at the end of the day, the honeypot shouldn't trigger. So you should raise them, like regardless of what it is. So it's just so if it's like you know some defender scanner, you need to yeah. whitelist it. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Do you, do you think there's value in integrating something like machine learning into honeypot servers? Things like ChatGPT really like. You could tell Jack G GPT to build a honeybot for you guys. Yeah, obviously not like that, but that's what I'm thinking where, like, especially like the SSH, where you can like, not actually execute the command, but return back what the command would then execute. No, yeah, I think it's like, I think there's potential for it. I think there's actually like honeypots to actually deal with it. Uh, uh, actually, I'm trying to see. My phone didn't burn. Yeah. Uh, there's just like a oh, it's not even shown it. Oh, oh never mind. Oh, no, I know why it's not shown. Uh, two seconds. Two seconds. Yeah. So the, this is like the list of like honeypots that actually I was um, able to come across. So like, there's just like an array of like what they can be used for and even tell you. So I think there's actually some machine learning ones on there, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, <laughs> yeah. that, the website up there was uh, Awesome Honeypots, if you ever want to come up, we'll go. Um, 
Yeah, um, I probably provide links and everything at the end of the talk if anyone needs them. So, yeah, no, um. I think it's Yeah? Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much, guys, for coming. Um, yeah. Enjoy the rest of the day.